there it is. Um, so I do want to mention, um, Carrie had asked if any of you are composting, which is a great question, but I want to make sure you understand that composting is totally different from vermicomposting, okay? So that is something we, we have to keep in mind. So, you know, when we're discussing it or, or seeking answers, um, we have to specify whether it's vermicomposting or composting. So, um, so uh, ver here's a definition, okay? So we know what we're talking about here. So vermicomposting, we're using earthworms and microorganisms. They're working together to help break down and stabilize organic materials. And they're converting them into a very valuable soil amendment that has really wonderful benefits on soil and plants. So, um, okay. So why would we want a verb and compost? So keeping food waste out of the landfills, I'm gonna talk about that more in a couple of slides from now. You can do it indoors, which is kind of nice because who would want to visit your, you know, have to go outside <laughs> today? Not that you would have to, you know, but, but it is nice that you can vermicompost either indoors or outdoors. Uh, it doesn't take much space and it gives you a soil amendment that does this to plants. So Look at the differences between these turnips. Um, and <laughs> we did an experiment over 20 years ago, and it was over the course of two years, spring, fall, spring, fall, in, even in different um, fields. And we had randomized plots, and we made sure that all of the turnips had equal amounts of nitrogen, but um, the one on the left, it's a regular sized turnip. Take a look at the root, look closely at the root. It's just one spindly root coming out of there, okay? It had zero vermicompost treatment. The one in the middle had 10% by volume. That means if say you had 10 cups of soil and you removed one cup and you replaced it with a cup of vermicompost. So that's all, 10%, it's not very much. But look what it did to that turnip. <laughs> look at the difference between zero and 10%. And look at the root system. You know, the roots are dramatically different as is the size of the turnip. The turnip greens are just huge. A lot of people like to eat turnip greens. And then, the one on the right had just 20% by volume vermicompost. And look how big it is, you know, really, really big. So, but what we've learned from, um, you know, scientific literature is that if you continue to add more vermicompost, then actually it would make the turnip back to the size of the one on the left. In other words, you can, vermicompost packs a really big punch. And if you get too much, it can actually make the plant smaller. So that's good news because there's a huge difference in price if you're buying vermicompost versus compost. We're gonna get to that next, but Remember I said we were gonna talk about landfills and this is what we don't really learn about in school, unfortunately. I've been doing, I've been working with landfills for 41 years. So um, I know quite a bit about landfills and what's interesting is all of us, we throw away all kinds of things, right? Cans and bottles, paper, food waste. Um, the largest category of waste that we create is paper, okay? So paper is the biggest category, but it's not the biggest category going to the landfill. Food waste is, which is ridiculous because it's, you know, just a small part of what is generated overall. And so, um, 
And so we have all this food waste going to landfills. And it turns out that it's worse than pretty much anything you would put into a landfill. So in other words, if you don't recycle your plastic bottle and it ends up in the landfill, it's just gonna sit there, okay? It's not gonna break down. But if you put food waste into a landfill, it's going to decompose very slowly in the absence of oxygen, which means it'll produce methane. Methane is really bad news. And you know, when we talk about climate change, we think of carbon dioxide, but methane is at least 34 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So methane is really a bad deal. And plus landfills will eventually leak. And so um, food actually makes things more toxic in the landfill. And so then it leaks out by through water or air and it's really bad news. So we really need to take it super seriously that we need to keep our food waste out of landfills and keep it out of sink disposals because that does really bad things too. So it's very easy to vermicompost and or compost. I like to have a compost bin in my backyard in addition to my worm bin, okay? The two can work together, but separately because they're separate, separate processes. But, um, and so this tells you very basically the difference between vermicomposting and composting. You can see that composting takes longer and it's because, you know, it'll heat up like the graph you see in the bottom right, the blue um, graph is temperature. So it's like you start with ambient temperature and then action of microorganisms eating this, this, decomposing all of these organic materials makes the temperature rise. And so you see how the temperature goes up and it stays up for a while and then it drops. And then you see, we don't stop there. We continue to let it cure, okay? So you want the temperature to go up, then come down. And then you wanna give it a few months at least for the temperature to stabilize at a, you know, at more of an ambient temperature and all sorts of good things happen during that curing phase. If you took compost, like after that temperature drops, if you just remove the compost and put it on your plants, it would probably harm them. It could kill them. If any of you have heard of or had the experience of burning the plants, it's because you had this unfinished compost that burned it, okay? Whereas if we look at the vermicomposting on the other side, it only takes two or three months. It stays at a lower temperature. So those words, mesophilic and thermophilic, refer to the temperature profile. So as we know with composting, it gets hot. So it gets into the thermophilic range. With vermicomposting, we want to keep it cool so it doesn't harm the worms or kill them so and the cool thing about keeping it in that mesophilic range is that you end up with greater numbers and greater varieties of microorganisms that are breaking down the materials and ending up in the finished product of vermicompost and with vermicompost it's the food is actually being consumed by an animal, the earthworm. So when it comes out the other end, it's stable. So you don't need that two or three month process of it cooling down because it comes out cool and stable. Um, with composting, you might know that it requires aeration or turning. So a lot of people are aware of that, but with vermicompost, no, <laughs> you don't turn it, you leave it the way it is. So, the, so there's really less work involved with vermicomposting. And so take heed to my little message there on the lower left. These are two separate comp, um, methods. They should not be combined. It's important for you to know that because I've heard the myth People say, oh, my compost pile isn't doing much. I heard if you add earthworms, it will speed up the process. And it's like, no, 
a, a compost bin or pile is not an appropriate place for you to add worms to it. Um, wild worms may be attracted to the decomposing material and they may crawl in from the bottom, but you never add worms to it, okay? So <clears throat> look at the price difference. Um, so that's a cubic yard of, of compost. And if you were to, to sell that in bulk, you know, it's not in bags, it's just one big cubic yard you could get up to about $30. So compost might sell for $10 or $15, 20 on up to maybe 30, okay? That's compost. Vermicompost for the same amount of cubic yard in bulk sells for $200 to $1,200. Big difference, huh? <laughs> So I want you to keep that in mind. And I keep that in mind as I tend my compost bin and my worm bin. I think this worm bin, the end product is much more valuable than the compost. And so I take a little more care with my worm bin, especially because it's smaller too. All right, so um, who is vermicomposting? So you may have heard uh, that your neighbor has a worm bin, or you might have heard, you know, maybe your child's classroom has a worm bin. So those are small bins, okay? Um, but it turns out that vermicomposting is taking place all over the place in, in, on a much larger scale. And that's what my book talks about, at mid to large scale vermicomposting. So on a much bigger level. So schools or daycare that are taking all of their um, food waste that's generated on site, you know, like cafeteria, um, uh, all of that gets vermicomposted, all right? They're doing it at farms, community gardens, restaurants are vermicomposting grocery stores, universities and colleges, paper mills, because, you know, organic paper, that can be consumed by worms, military bases, hospitals, prisons. I've done a lot of work with prisons throughout the country with vermicomposting, and then businesses. So some businesses will do it on site as well. All right, so, and also, so that tells you some of the sites where vermicomposting is taking place, but people in 117 countries have con contacted me personally, like they have emailed me, sometimes call, and <laughs> so every continent, except for Antarctica, go figure, but um, 117 countries of people who are doing really large scale vermicomposting and they have some questions about it or they need some assistance. All right, so these are the things that you need to know about earthworms to get into vermicomposting, okay? These are just the basics, all right? We're not gonna go at length about, you know, their physiology and their internal organs and all that. You don't need to know that. It's fascinating, so you know I encourage you to read about it. But anyway, this is what's important for you to know. First of all, earthworms are cold-blooded, which is different from us because we're warm-blooded. When it's cold like it is right now, we shiver, and that helps us to warm up. And when it's hot, we'll sweat, and that helps us to cool down. And the earthworms can't do either. They can't shiver or sweat. And so they're at the mercy of the temperature of the environment that they're in. And just like us, they have preferences for temperatures and they react to temperatures. So I'll be talking about what's the best temperature for them. What, what's the zone of comfort for them? So they're hermaphroditic. And so if you ask, is that a boy worm or a girl worm? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's, it's both. It has 
what it takes. One worm carries what it takes to make babies, okay? But you need two worms to get together and then they both leave pregnant because all the, each worm has what it needs to take babies. It's just, you need two to tangle for many earthworm species and definitely the species we're gonna talk about. So they don't have lungs like we do and they breathe through their skin. So the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide goes through their skin and their skin has to be moist for that to take place. So if they get dried out, they can die because they'll just suffocate. And they're also, even though they don't have eyes, they're very sensitive to light. They have sensors that can sense light and it can actually paralyze them if they're out, in, if they're exposed to light for about an hour. So, you know, if they had nowhere to hide from the light, that's why after a rainstorm, you know, people say, oh, the, the worm burrows were gonna, getting flooded. They were going to drown. That's not why they leave. Um, and, and if there's enough oxygen in the water, they're not going to die. They could live for a few weeks in oxygenated water. It's because, again, since they need moisture for their skin, it starts raining and they're like, woohoo, we get to leave the burrow and glide about on that moisture. And so they like that. But say they're crossing the sidewalk and all of a sudden it stops raining and the sun comes out and it's really bright. And so if they can't get off that sidewalk right away, they're going to get paralyzed. And then evaporation is going to take place. So the moisture on their body is going to evaporate and then they die. And that's why you're finding dead worms on the sidewalk. So just those are the basics that I want you to know. The next part is super important and it might be a little mind blowing for, for you. Okay. So when we think of earthworms, we think, you know, hey, they're, I know what an earthworm is. You know, I've seen them, they're underground. Everybody knows they live in the earth, right? That's what everybody thinks. And in fact, just yesterday, somebody contacted me and said, um, you know, they had a question about mobility of earthworms. And they said, yeah, how about a, you know, just a general run of the mill earthworm, common earthworm. And I said, mm, there's no common. <laughs> there are over 9,000 species of earthworms. They range in size from half an inch to up to 12 feet long. So big difference, right? And so you need to understand that all earthworms are not alike. And this is probably the most important slide I'll show you today, okay? Because I really want to emphasize that these are all earthworms and scientists have divided them into three different groups according to where they live and what they eat. So first we have the anisic earthworms and they are in general kind of like the big fat night crawlers, okay? They're long, they're kind of, you know, they're big. You can see they live in the soil in vertical burrows, okay? So we hear a lot about them. And I think when we think of earthworms, we usually think of them. We think of vertical burrows in the soil. They're eating soil and litter, okay? So they consume the soil while they're underground in the burrow. And then at night, when it's not sunny, they'll, poke, they'll come out and grab some leaf litter and take it back down into their burrow and consume it, okay? So living in the soil, eating the soil, all right? Doing what we would expect of earthworms. The endogeics live in soil and they're actually in horizontal burrows, which is very cool because you've got the vertical burrows, you've got the horizontal bur burrows. So these earthworms are, you know, really doing some, so much for the soil. They're very helpful. But just keep in mind, they're living in the soil and they're eating soil, just like we would expect an earthworm to do. And the point of why I'm going over this is because 
There's a third type of earthworm, okay? They are earthworms, but do you see any mention of soil? They're living in litter on top of the soil, okay? They're living above ground. They're not burrowing into the ground. And they're eating litter, which would be leaf litter. So that's why I have a pile of leaves there. You would find them underneath the leaf pile where it's nice and moist there and you have decomposing organics. Same with that cow patty you see in the picture, which is cow poop. And you'll see worms in there and they're epigeics. They love decaying organics. So remember they are earthworms, but they're not living underground, all right? So these are the ones we're gonna use for vermicomposting. And so what are you gonna put in, an er in a worm bin? Not soil, okay? They don't live in soil. So we're not gonna put soil in the worm bin, all right? So out of 9,000 species of earthworms, only seven species have been identified that are suitable for vermicomposting. And out of that, those seven species, there's one species in particular that most people like to use worldwide for vermicomposting, okay? So it's called Isenia fetida. We like to use scientific names because then we know we're talking about that specific species. If we use common names, then you might call it red wiggler. Um, when I go to other countries, they say, I want the California red worm as if it's a separate species from the red wiggler, but no, it's Isenia fetida. And you can see on the slide here that I've made a pronunciation for it so you can remember. Um, but people do tend to call by common names. And so um, red wiggler probably is, uh, you know, one of the most common names for Isenia fetida. Some people call them tiger worms or brandling worms or the California red worms or just red worms, lots of common names, depending on where people live, okay? But Isenia fetida, like I said, is what most people like to use year, uh, worldwide. And it's because they're really, they, they just have a lot of really great traits. Like you can count on them to eat a lot of food, to reproduce really well and provide that valuable poop that we want, okay? Um, which we call vermicompost or vermicast, all right? Um, and it adapts well to being domesticated, you know? Um, kept in a bin or, I mean, some people do just not even have a bin, you know, but it, it's, it's a good idea to have a bin, but they adapt really well to it, okay? Other worm species can be very temperamental <laughs> and they can try to exit that bin. So Isenia fetida is kind of the easiest to work with and they tolerate a wider range of environmental conditions than other earthworms. So where do you get Isenia fetida? Well, you always wanna start with a pound. And I'm serious about that, okay? Cause some people think, oh, to save money or whatever, I'll just get half a pound. Well, they don't eat as much as you would expect. They only eat a quarter to a third of their body weight, even though there are claims on the internet that say that they eat their whole body weight per day. And that's not true, okay? so. You want to start with about a thousand worms and nobody wants to count a thousand worms. All right. So, um, so they're weighed. And so you'll receive a pound. When I receive a pound of worms though, I know that there should be roughly a thousand. So I don't pick through and count, you know, <laughs> one, two, I'm not going to do that, but what I do do is just kind of eyeball it and say, you know, this looks like a thousand because it might not, you know, it might be a lot less. So you really want to keep an eye on that. So you don't want to get them from your yard. You could have a hundred species in your yard. 
you're not going to be able to tell which ones are Isenia fetida. So it really is best to buy it from a worm farmer. Um, <clears throat> and if you went to the bait shop and you asked for red wigglers to equal a thousand of them, you would need at least 36 of these. Um, you can see these styrofoam cups and the styrofoam cup, what are we going to do with that? That's going to have to go to the landfill, which is not good. We're trying to keep things out of the landfill. So, and plus you'd end up spending well over a hundred dollars for these worms. So it's best if you um, buy it from a worm grower. I will tell you that there's a shortage of worms. There's um, vermicomposting has become so popular and now with the pandemic even more so. And so a lot of worm farmers are running out of worms. So just so you know, um, Okay, so this is what Isenia fetida needs. Remember, temperature is a really big thing, okay? Because they're, they're sensitive to temperatures, right? So what's your most comfortable temperature? Well, I know that my comfort zone happens to be the same as theirs. Look, 60 to 80, think about it. That's pretty comfortable starts getting hotter or starts getting colder and you start getting less comfortable. And for us, we could, you know, take off some clothes or add jackets. For them, they're at the mercy of the environment. So they will tolerate, um, from scientific studies, it says they'll tolerate 32 to 95 degrees, but their sweet spot is around 60 to 80 degrees, okay? So <clears throat> between 60 and 80, they're gonna consume more and reproduce more, which is what we want them to do. And the, the more they get away from that range, they can stay alive. I've had worms stay alive when it was 10 degrees for a few days. I've had them stay alive when it was 110, you know, but it's earthworm husbandry that helped keep that going. And I know that if it is outside of that nice zone of 60 to 80, they're going to slow down and they're not going to eat or reproduce as much. All right. So moisture. Remember I said their skin has to stay moist for them to stay alive. <coughs> and so worms prefer about 80% moisture. <clears throat> so what that means is if excuse me, if you had a sponge and you got it wet and you squeezed the water out of it, um, if you were to squeeze it some more, you'll get some, some drops, okay? Um, that's how you could determine it from the worm bin. You can just kind of eyeball it. And see in that photo how, how the skin of the worm seems to be glistening and that's what you look for too, because your worms will actually look dry if they're too dry. So, um, so just keep that in mind. But they tend to live in the top four inches of whatever you have them in, like a bin. And so you would want the top four inches to be 80%, but you wouldn't want the whole bin to be 80%, okay? You want it to be drier the deeper it goes. So they do need oxygen, right? They're living beings. They need oxygen. But if you have too much oxygen, then the moisture can escape. And then it's not moist enough for them. Um, they tolerate a wider range of pH than other species of earthworms. So they prefer neutral, which is 7.0. But they will to tolerate, you know, um, more alkaline or acid um, pH, but it's nice if you can aim for neutral. And they are sensitive to ammonia and salts. And so even though they really like livestock manure, you would not want to feed them chicken manure because chicken manure is very high in ammonia and it could kill the worms. All right, so quickly, when the two worms come together and they both leave pregnant, each of them will produce what we call a cocoon. 
And so it slips off the over the top of their head and you'll find them in the worm bin. And these are highly magnified. So um, that's a match head there, okay? So they're about the size of a match head. And they do look like mini lemons and they're kind of, they're shiny and light brown. And two to four babies, I'm sorry, two to seven babies will emerge from an Isenia fetida cocoon. So that tells you that if it was a different species of earthworm, they would have a different range of, of babies, okay? Because all these different species, they're, they're different from each other. But two to seven will come out, on average three live babies come out of a cocoon. And that's after several weeks, okay, four to six weeks. And then it takes another um, seven to 11 weeks for them to become adults. So what will worms eat? They eat a wide range of things, okay? So we're gonna keep the ammonia and the salts in mind, but you know, if you're gonna do vermicomposting on a large scale, these are some of the things you could feed them, like feed them compost. You could feed them livestock manure, except for chicken. Um, food scraps, spoiled grain, coffee grounds, some brewery ways, you know, um, which are different because, you know, think about it. You don't just buy a beer, you buy different types. And so they have different ingredients. So you can't just assume that, oh, they're going to eat it. Um, yard debris, cardboard, scrap paper, and crop residues from farms. So these are some of the things that worms will eat, all right? But what everybody really needs to do, you don't just jump into it. You don't, you know, listen to my lecture and see dollar signs because I told you you could sell your vermicompost for $1,200. You wouldn't just buy a hundred pounds of worms and go at it, you know, just like you wouldn't leave a lecture and on the way home, buy a herd of cattle, you know, because who knows how to raise cows if you haven't done it before. And it makes sense, right? You'd be like, no, I wouldn't just buy a herd of cows because how do I take care of the cows, you know, like, how do I shelter them? How do I feed them? What do I feed them, you know? And so I'm emphasizing this because I've known people to buy a whole bunch of worms and they have no experience with worms. And they just assume that, oh, it's just a worm. I can keep it alive. And it's like, no, there are many, many ways to accidentally kill worms. So you wanna start with a small worm bin and develop your worm husbandry skills. So they're animal husbandry. That's what we call taking care of animals and helping them to thrive. So in this, uh, on this slide, I just show you some, some just different types of worm bins that people uh, buy or make. Okay, so on the lower left, those are um, the can of worms and an old worm factory. Uh, those are both mine. I have a compost learning lab at the university and I have a worm barn and inside the worm barn, I have 12 different types of, of worm bins. So these are two of them. If you were to buy them, they would look a lot newer than these. These are over 20 years old, but um, you would spend over a hundred dollars for them. And they're great because there's less labor in harvesting these bins, but it's a lot, you know, a hundred bucks to start doing, you know, start a hobby. That's kind of a lot for people to lay out. So, so above it, you'll see two bins that <coughs> cost about, you know, between five and $10 that you get from a big box store or hardware store. Um, the one on the bottom, I think is 10 gallons. The one on the top is 18 gallons. I like a 14 gallon bin to start with. Um, and so that's, so that's an easy, cheap way to get started with vermicomposting. 
Um, some people will just take concrete blocks, stack them too high, and then make whatever size they want. Um, usually outside they do that. Um, and then I just wanted to show you in the bottom right, I have a, this picture in my book as well, but it's someone who took, who lives in wine country. And those are wine boxes, like really nice boxes that, you know, you would buy, you know, two or three bottles of wine in it. And they've turned them into worm bins. And then you've got a half a barrel, you know, because they use these barrels to make wine too. So that's a beautiful worm bin too. So um, <coughs> this is the first worm bin that I ever made, okay? So this is a 14 gallon that I spent $5 on it. You want it to have a lid. <coughs> In this publication, free publication on my website, um, I give three different ways of putting holes in the bin, but because you get it and there aren't any holes, right? Well, the, the worms need to breathe and the microorganisms. So you have to put holes in it, but you have to be strategic about it. So you only put them in the upper sides of the bin. Look very closely at this picture. There are no holes in the lid. There are no holes down below that upper inch that goes around the side of the bin, okay? So that's where you put your holes. <coughs> Those holes you're seeing, they were huge, you know? That was my first bin and they were like half inch holes and it worked really well. I still have that bin. But now when I do it, I like to make lots of tiny holes. So I take the smallest drill bit in my set and I just, again, in that zone, the upper inch of the sides of the bin, I'll just put a bunch of tiny holes and that's plenty for the worms. That gives a draw. I do it all the way around. So it's drawing, there's like this little cross breeze and there's plenty of air for the worms. All right, because the worms come up to eat. So just having oxygen in the top of that bin is fine. Now I do recommend uh, drilling about six holes on the bottom um, for drainage. But let me tell you, if you're doing things correctly, you will not have excess liquid accumulating in your worm bin. If you do, you're doing things wrong. So you really want to not have um, excess liquid. But if you do, then you want to get it out of there. All right, where to put your worm bin? So there's my first worm bin again. And that was my old office at the university. And so I just kept it under my desk because open space there, plenty of room for a worm bin. You can see next to it on the left, there's a three prong garden tool. I always have a three prong garden tool next to my worm bin, no matter what size, like I have a 40 square foot worm bin. And so I have the same tool that I use for that. Okay, so you can keep it, if you have a garage, I've never had a garage here in North Carolina, but if I did, um, you know, you could keep it in there. Some people keep it in their kitchen or their basement. Some people make a lovely coffee table for their living room that's also a warm bin. I kept, I took this home and kept it in my bathroom for a while because, you know, I had the same shape of openness, you know? So I had the, the bathroom counter with the drawers on the, on each side with this big empty space in between. And it's like worm bin. So that's why I kept it. But some people keep it in the closet or, it can be outdoors. I actually now keep my worm bins outside and you always want them to be in a shady spot. All right, here's an example. Here's somebody I know who lives in a big expensive home and this is their lovely laundry room. And um, you can see a curtain there and counter and that's where the worm bin is. The husband doesn't even know they have a worm bin. So, cause you know, the worms don't make noise. It doesn't smell. So it just, it stays, you know, in that empty space behind the curtain. And then she made her worm bin to have wheels. So she wheels it out when she wants to feed them. All right, um, but 
the, the plastic worm bin, like I've been showing you, it's not moist, right? And the worms need moisture. So you need to give them bedding. So whatever size worm bin. So when you do become a worm farmer, say, you know, you always need bedding. Bedding is like a safe zone for the worms to hang out and be comfortable. It's separate from what they eat. It is organic, so they do end up eating it, but the purpose is to feed them something else, all right? So I give you six different choices for household or classroom vermicomposting. So you could take shredded office paper or leaves or coconut core or corrugated cardboard, like the Amazon boxes you get, um, compost or shredded newspaper. And you can see in the pictures that I've provided and you, if you're like my box where I can see myself talking, um, you can move that around at the top. So, so mine, I just moved it because it was blocking the photos. So in the pictures I show that I have um, just used my hands to just tear strips of newspaper and you know, they're only about half an inch wide. And I put them into a bucket of clean water and let them soak for 10 minutes. So all the fibers absorb all of the moisture. And then I, I squeeze it out. I squeeze out that excess moisture and then put it in the worm bin. Not in a big clump, you know, because I've just squeezed it into a ball. I'm not going to throw a bunch of these balls in there. I'm going to, you can see from the bottom photo that I've fluffed it out. I've pulled it apart. So, you know, it was in a ball and now I'm pulling it apart and I'm adding it to the worm bin. And you're going to fill that worm bin halfway full. And this is only for household. This is not for large scale. I give a separate lecture on large scale, okay? This is if you have a small bin like what I've shown you, you wanna just put the moist bedding in halfway, all right? Okay, so then you're gonna add earthworms. They're gonna come in a bag or a box or both. And so this shows that I, I got these actually in Durham um, and they're in a nice muslin bag and then in a large um, uh, Chinese takeout container, you know? And so anyway, I, I take the bag out of there, open it up and then gently let the contents of the bag come out on top of the bedding. And I leave it there, okay? Worms have very fragile bodies. So if I'm like, oh, let me help you get under the, the bedding where, you know, they want to be. No, no, no. I might accidentally hurt them or kill them. Okay. So they're going to move away from the light. Remember I said that they're sensitive from light. So they're going to move away from the light and they'll go underneath. And then you'll always have some hanger honors <laughs> inside that bag. They do not want to come out. And if you try to pull them out, you're gonna accidentally squeeze them to death. So what I do, okay, I've got this dry bag, I've got the moist bedding. So I just lay the, the dry bag on top and put the lid on the bin, come back the next day, the bag is empty because the worms have left that dry bag and they've moved out into the moist bedding. And so, you know, so that's the way to empty the bag, all right? So when you're ready to add food waste to the bin, they're not hungry right away. So do not put food waste in, in advance. In fact, I would wait until the next day because the worms really need to settle into the bin. They're in a new environment. They're probably in different bedding and they've gotten shaken up. However, they've arrived at your doorstep. And so they need to just chill and <laughs> relax and get to know their new environment. So they're not hungry. In fact, sometimes if worms are really shaken up, they'll try to get out of the bin, okay? And so you may have to leave the light on for the next three to seven days so that you know there's always light around that bin. And so the worms are not gonna leave the bin because they don't wanna come out into the light. And so 
that actually kind of forces them to stay in the bin and just relax. And so after, like I said, three to seven days, they're like, oh, okay, this isn't such a scary place after all. I'm going to just, you know, hang out in this bin. So again, three-pronged garden tool. You're going to pull back some bedding. You're going to put in food. And then you're going to cover the food with bedding, okay? You'll notice on this slide, I put cover twice in red and bold. <laughs> Do you think that means that I think covering is important? It's super important because if you've ever, um, like you've invited guests over they, and you're making a nice fruit salad in your kitchen and your guests arrive early. And so you go into the living room to talk to them. In the meantime, you have all this fruit just lying there, right? You come back and what are there? There's fruit flies. And if you have two fruit flies, very quickly, very quickly, you'll end up with hundreds of them. And that's no fun. Who wants a cloud of fruit flies around your worm bin? Nobody. In the least somebody would want is around their lovely coffee table worm bin, right? You don't want your guests swatting at flies. So with the covering, you need to be OCD about it, okay? Obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> so that means that you don't see any food waste, okay? I'm giving you this warning because you really don't want to invite fruit flies to your worm bin. And if the food is covered, they won't know it's there. And it's best if you wait until the food is gone before you add more, that's ideal, all right? So you want your bin, when you take the lid off, you want it to look like on the left. Actually, in reality, it will have, you'll see little brown marks all over. And it's um, because the worms are exploring inside their bin and they're pooping as they go. So it won't be that pristine looking, but you don't see food waste, right? Whereas on the right, that's like way too much food to begin with and it's not covered. So it's just gonna rot and stink and attract fruit flies and other pests, all right? So don't do like the right. You want, again, I always think about the value of the vermicompost and I think, okay, I wanna be special. I am not an OCD person, <laughs> but when it comes to covering food waste, I am, you know, I'm just thorough and I make sure that it looks like that on the left. All right. So um, collecting the food scraps, you don't want to have to run over to your worm bin every time you eat an apple, right? So most people collect their food scraps and a lot of people will either buy a container or reuse a container with a lid. In both of those cases, you have to have a lid um, because it may be a while before you actually feed your worms, okay? Um, I, I feed my compost bin once a week. Okay, so for a whole week, food waste is accumulating and it will start to decompose and it'll give off odors. When the lid is on, that's not a problem, but you take the lid off and it's like, oh, that really stinks, you know? And so after 20 years or so, I decided I'm gonna put my food scraps in the freezer. So that's where they go. Um, you'll see in this picture, I had eaten an orange. That's not gonna go in my worm bin but it will go in my compost bin, okay? But you can see I have two plastic containers. They'll hold a week's worth of food for me. And they're called plastic shoe boxes. You can Google it. And they only cost a dollar each. And they don't have lids because why would you need a lid? You're putting food waste into the freezer and within a very short period of time, it freezes, so it's not gonna give off odors. It's not gonna decompose. So this is the easiest and less yuckiest way to um, collect your food scraps. All right, so uh, many things can be fed to your worms like vegetables, many types of fruit, coffee grounds, tea leaves, bread, pasta, lots of, you know, lots of different types of food. And you can see, there's my chopped up food in my, um, in my freezer. 
uh, plastic shoe box. Okay. So, um, but these are things that I recommend not putting in a worm bin. So meat, grease, bones, and dairy products, they give off really stinky odors. Okay. And they can attract carnivorous animals. So it's really not a good idea. Um, cat and dog feces, we know has pathogens. So it's not a good thing to put in a regular worm bin. If you wanted to do it separately, that's, that's another subject, but not in a regular worm bin. And the worms are kind of sensitive to, you know, they don't really like things with vinegar or hot peppers, onions, garlic. So I wouldn't put kimchi, for example, into my worm bin for those reasons. Now a small worm, a, a large worm bin is fine to put citrus in, but a small worm bin, no. So the worm bins I've told you about, don't put citrus in it, okay? It's too acidic. Um, if I, We already talked about salty foods, but sugary foods, it could attract ants. So that's why I recommend not putting, you know, real sugary things in there. All right, particle size is super important for, because you've got microorganisms and worms working together, okay? Neither one of them have teeth. Uh, microbes don't even have mouths. Worms have mouths, but they're teeny tiny. And so, so they're, none of them are just coming up and taking bites of things, all right? So if you have a particle size like the one on the left, they can only access the outer edges of that, of that uh, particle. But if you chop it up, what you're seeing in yellow is now freshly exposed and so to the worms and microbes. And so they're gonna decompose much more quickly. All right, so <clears throat> healthy worm bin trades, it's gonna smell like um, the forest, okay? So when the lid is on the worm bin, you don't smell anything at all. When you take the lid off, it just smells like earth, you know, a really beautiful earthy smell. You shouldn't see earthworms, okay? It's ideal if you actually don't see worms when you open the lid. Um, and if you see up to maybe six moving around on the sides or the lid of the bin, that's fine. If it's more than that, then, you know, there might be something bad going on in the bin. So the publication I'm gonna tell you about has a troubleshooting guide. And so you can figure out what may be wrong by using that guide. Again, the food is not visible because you have been OCD with covering it. The bedding has air spaces because not because you're gonna, you're not gonna churn it up. No, you just wanna leave it the way it is, but you wanna make sure that when you put it in there that it does have air spaces. So the contents will be damp, but not soggy dripping wet, all right? And we talked about how the earthworms need to have moist glistening skin. And you'll notice that the bedding is disappearing over time. So eventually you'll have to add more bedding to cover up that food, but it'll be several weeks before you'll need that. You will notice small quantities of other critters in the bin. So you'll see some insects in there. And that's because th there were insect eggs on the food that you added to the bin. And so they'll hatch and then but it's fine. It's good to have them because they're decomposers. They'll help tear apart that food and decompose it. It's when really red mites are the only things you have to worry about. And you won't get those unless you make the bin too acidic by adding citrus or adding, you know, tomato, a bunch of tomatoes or something. So just keep that in mind. And when the worms poop, that poop ends up on the bottom of the bin, always, okay? So um, <clears throat> to get that poop out of there, I'm gonna give you three different methods. Um, the first is called light separation. Remember, worms are sensitive to light, they're gonna move away from it. So you're gonna take your worm bin and you're gonna dump it upside down. You're just gonna go zoop like that and it's gonna be under light. So a nice bright sunny day or under bright lights indoors. And you either make one big pile or several like you can see on the left. 
Um, you can use an old shower curtain or a tarp or big piece of plastic. But when you dump that, the castings are not now going to be on the top, right? So you're going to have a container labeled black gold for your valuable vermicompost. And so you dump it and give it a few minutes because the worms are going to move away from the light. And then you're going to take that vermicompost and put it in your black gold container. And actually, once you dump that bin, um, for those few minutes before you start removing the vermicompost, it's important to uh, restart your worm bin. So you're just going to go through what I told you to do and setting up your worm bin and filling it halfway with moist bedding, the bedding of your choice, right? And then as you go through there and you find any worms or old bedding or food, that would go back into your bin, all right? So basically you're gonna end up with your bin with you know worms and bedding and stuff in it. And you're gonna have that separate container for vermicompost. And when I do light separation, it takes me 60 to 90 minutes to do it by myself. All right, the second way is called sideways separation. So you do everything I've told you about, right? And the, the <clears throat> vermicompost is accumulating on the bottom of the bin. And you say, <coughs> wow, this is several inches deep. Yeah, I think it's time to start harvesting it. And so with sideways separation, you don't have to touch worms, all right? You visually divide the worm, the worm bin in half. So you've been vermicomposting throughout the entire bin, right? You get to the point where you wanna harvest and you start only feeding on one side of the bin. So that's why in this photo you see, you see the dark castings on the left side you see the bedding on the right hand side. That's where you're gonna bury food waste. And that's where worms are gonna migrate over there. But worms are not like cats and dogs who are like, ah, there's the food. I'm gonna rush over there and grab the food. They're not like that. They're more Joe cool chill, all right? So it could take a few weeks before most of the worms make it to that other side. So once they're over there, and in the meantime, you've got, you're only, if you need any water, you only spritz it, but it, you would only put it on the side with the bedding. You would kind of fluff up that other side to help the moisture to evaporate. So then it's less comfortable for the worms and they're gonna go, oh, I think I'd rather be on that other side that's moist. So that's what you do. So few weeks and then you harvest that vermicompost from the left hand side in the photo and then you put bedding on that side and only start feeding on that side and the worms will move back. All right, so that's sideways separation. Then there's vertical separation. Same concept where you're getting the worms to move according to where you put the food, okay? And so with this, there's a picture of a can of worms on the right. Remember I showed you my can of worms in my worm barn um, that costs over $100. And on the left, we have two bins that we picked up from a big box store and they each cost $5, all right? So you're gonna set one bin aside and ignore it, okay? You're gonna do your vermicomposting in one bin, exactly how I've described. And then you'll notice that you'll get, you know, like a few inches of, of uh, three or four inches of vermicompost. And so, when, so then you put in that second bin, you fit it, fit it on top, and then you ignore the bottom bin, okay? You only feed in the top bin. And for that, it, for that system, you're going to want more than six holes on the bottom. You're going to want lots of little holes in the bottom big enough for the worms to crawl through because they'll go up through into that second bin to get food, okay? And so again, after several weeks, you'll notice that most of the worms are in that top bin. The other bin, you know, it's like there's worm poop down there, but there's no, you know, there's less moisture, there's no food. So they'll move into the top and then you can just remove that lower bin 
and empty out the vermicompost and keep vermicomposting in that top bin, which has now become the bottom bin, okay? All right, so um, also some people will just uh, take it and um, dump it on a screen. So on the left, she took hardware cloth and wood and made a screen and it's over her um, wheelbarrow. And so, you know, the finer particles of vermicompost would go through and the rest would go back in the worm bin. And the one on the right is a trommel screen that you can make, it rotates and the worms will come out one end and then the finer particles will go down below. All right, so what do we end up with after we harvest this? We're gonna have a fully stabilized soil amendment because it's passed through an animal and come out the other end, right? So it's stable. It's gonna have more microbes than what they have originally started with. Uh, the pH is going to be near neutral. The, it'll have high water holding capacity. It'll be fine particulates, because again, it's come out the rear end of a worm, so it's very fine. It's going to convert nutrients into forms that are readily taken up by plants. And what's really cool is that it's gonna have plant growth hormones in fulvic and humic acids. And so those along with all those microorganisms are gonna make it just amazing for soil and plants. So very quickly, um, the beneficial effects on soils, it's gonna add organic matter in the microbes, it's gonna improve soil structure and reduce erosion and make the soil more porous so that when it rains, it can penetrate the soil, it goes down into the soil, and then it actually retains the moisture right around the plant roots, which is very cool. It breaks up clay soils. What a, what a wonderful thing for us here in the Piedmont who just have so much clay in our soils. Um, so it'll be easier to cultivate it and it, it just has an, an incredible number of effects on soils. Um, what it does to plants is just amazing. So seeds will generate more quickly. The plants will grow bigger and they'll um, have higher yields of whatever that plant is supposed to produce, whether it be flowers or fruit or vegetables. The roots you saw from my turnip photo that the roots were better developed and so they can tolerate stress better. They can, um, there's less transplant shock. And then another really cool thing it does is it will decrease attacks by plant pathogens. So plant diseases will actually not, they'll be repelled by the vermicompost. Parasitic nematodes and then arthropods, insects will be repelled by the vermicompost. So very cool things. And if you don't believe me, you know, I'm not just saying this, I'm not making this up. So if you go to Google Scholar, which means, you know, if you're in Chrome or something, you've got that Google bar, you know, and you just type in Google Scholar and it takes you to a page that looks exactly like, you know, regular Google. And then you type in keywords. So at the end of January, I typed in vermicompost effects on plant growth. And then in less than a third of a second, 32,700 scientific articles came up. So these are in scientific journals. You can see around the world that people have done um, studies on the effects of plant growth and then uh, how vermicompost suppresses plant disease, 7,000, um, how it suppresses plant pests, 8280. So big effect, okay, and lots of scientific studies. So the vermicompost, you can put it in gardens, lawns, trees, you know, planted around trees, um, nurseries, farms, vineyards, golf courses, turf, and house plants. So top dressing um, house plants. So again, you can see from the turnip um, experiment we did, you only need 10 or 20% by volume, okay? So that would be like, you know, half an inch, um, 10% by volume is half an inch of vermicompost, that's the VC, 
to four and a half inches of soil. Or if you need more soil, say you're growing uh, potatoes or carrots or something, um, one inch of vermicompost to nine inches of soil, and then double that amount for the 20%, okay? So um, don't have time for that. I'm gonna mention that, remember I said, in a well-managed worm bin, you will not have excess liquid coming out. It, it bothers me that you can buy bins like the one on the right with a tap because it's it assumes you're gonna do it wrong. But look what's coming out of there. This dark, this black liquid that's stinky, that's leachate. And people will call it worm tea or vermicompost tea. And no, it's not. So look at the picture on the left, how it's, you know, it looks more like tea, right? It's, it's more of a light brown color. And you can see that they're steeping um, vermicompost or compost that's actually in a mesh bag. And so the nutrients and the microbes are leaching out into that clean water. But if there's something dark leaking out of the bottom of your worm bin, ugh, make sure you don't use it on anything you're gonna eat or any plants that you value, you know, because it could have pathogens. Um, it is anaerobic, that's why it stinks. So uh, it could have sulfides and acids from that and high salt content from the material that went into the bin. So it's, um, it's a mystery what that stuff is. And you just have to, if that happens to you, then read the troubleshooting guide and be more careful with your worm bin so you don't um, have that excess liquid, all right? Um, so we're running out of time. I wanna leave time for questions. So if you go to my website, you can see on the bottom there, that's my website address at NC State University. I've been there for 28 years. So I have like tons of publications that I've written um, about vermicomposting and composting and some other topics. Um, and so when you go to, uh, you'll see a menu on the left of different things to click on. If you click on vermicomposting, you'll come up with about uh, six to eight different topics you can click on. So we were talking about household vermicomposting today. So you would click on vermicomposting, then you click on four households and there's some paragraphs and then it says publications and they're listed alphabetically. So the last one is worms can recycle your garbage. It's only five pages long, but you've just sat through this for a little over an hour and you're gonna need your mind to be refreshed. And so go to that publication and it will um, tell you what to need, you know, review that before you try vermicomposting. I also have a video on worm bins and how to start a worm bin too. So, and then if you went back and clicked on four businesses, farms, institutions, and municipalities, you would find even more publications because Remember I said people from around the world in 117 countries have contacted me. That's what they're asking about is larger scale vermicomposting. So you can click on raising earthworms successfully and it'll give you more in-depth information than the worms can recycle, but it also tells you how to do it on a larger scale. I do have a curriculum. It's a 4-H curriculum um, that's really, in the picture is this fifth grade, we changed that. Um, it's really for any age group. So from preschool to 12th grade. So if it's for teachers to use, homeschoolers, um, after school teachers, uh, scouts, 4-H, church groups, um, it has six different chapters and 12 different activities you can do with children with vermicomposting. So check that out. And then if you are interested in larger scale vermicomposting, that's the cover of my book on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, this is not the order of the chapters, but these are the subjects that I talk about. So 
vermicomposting operations around the world. Um, I highlight about two, di two dozen different types. So you can see what people are doing and they're doing it in a variety of ways. So it's very interesting. Um, benefits to soils and plants, more than what I told you today. Um, choosing what type of production system you want, finding feedstocks, monitoring the worm bed, um, what to do with the vermicast that you harvest and markets and how to avoid pitfalls and then business and marketing plans. So lots of information and that's available from anybody who sells books, okay? And your local bookstore, Amazon, whoever, all right? So here's my contact information. Um, this is copyrighted but there's my website and my email address. And I'll stop there so I can answer questions. Oh, that's fantastic, Rhonda. Thank you so, sure. so <laughs> much. So we have a lot, we've gotten a lot of questions. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna yeah. hit, hit the ground running here. All right, so we're gonna start. Um, so Patrick actually had a question about regular composting. So you were talking about the later processing um, in, in regular composting. So is that later processing, the breaking down of the nitrates by bacteria? Later processing, do you mean during the curing? Yeah, I think during the curing. Yeah, during the curing, a lot of things take place. So acids and, um, and, and yes, it, it does affect the nutrients and it stabilizes everything. So awesome. Yeah. And then Ed Mello has a question. So um, what's the difference between mealworms and the, um, the worms? Oh yeah, so they're very different and, and mealworms are, are very easy to raise. So a lot of people raise them and you can feed all sorts of animals. Including people, animals. we do, we feed like, people mealworms for bug fest. You know, <laughs> so if you have, uh, you know, I don't know, frogs and different pets, iguanas, whatever, they like mealworms, but yeah, it's a, a, just a separate process, okay? They're not earthworms. So I was talking about composting earthworms today, but um, mealworms, you know, would be a different subject. Yeah. Awesome, and Kristen has a question. Is it safe to feed them things that have already started to de decompose or that have mold on them? Um. little bits of, you know, things that have decomposed, that are decomposing. Yes. Mold. You really don't want to get a lot of mold in your worm bin. Okay. And especially you do, you do have to keep in mind mold allergies and we all have something in our blood that helps us to deal with mold in the environment because it's all over the place. But, you know, if you've been damaged by, um, you know, if you have certain medical conditions, you can be extremely sensitive to mold. And so, you know, and, and I mentioned you could put bread in your worm bin, but I wouldn't put uh, dry bread in a worm bin. I would run it underneath the faucet just to get it moist. And then it doesn't develop mold. But if you just put it in dry, that can become moldy. So, yeah. So interesting, I think that- So I would put, you know, like I said, a, a, an outdoor compost bin is more forgiving, you know, and it's a bigger space than a worm bin. So I would put moldy stuff in my outdoor compost bin and not think anything of it, just like I would put orange peels and whatever. But in a worm bin, you know, you just have to keep in mind that it's smaller and if it's indoors, then you don't want a bunch of mold. Awesome. So Mike is wondering about a zero cost method or a bin free technique. Well, that could be, be um, that's why a lot of people will scrounge materials. So scrap wood that has not been treated, you know, um, and, you know, the concrete blocks and um, people have made worm bins out of all sorts of materials. So, so that's possible. Um, if you had an indoor operation, you could have a pile. Or if you lived in 
California, you can have an outdoor pile. <laughs> Here in North Carolina, think about how cold it is today. That would be very uncomfortable for the worms. Um, and it gets super hot here in the summer, but it's very common in California for people just to have these big long windrows in their backyards. So that's completely, you know, free of, uh, you know, not building a bin for them. So yes, you can just have piles or wedges. That's a different method, you know. And I talk about all of that in my book. And that's why in my book, I talk about all these different ways of doing it. And I think it's beautiful that people do do it in different ways. You know, if I started out saying every one of you has to buy a bin for over $100, you know, most of the people would have tuned this out already because, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to have to invest that kind of money. So, um, that's why I like to show different ways that people are doing it all over the world. Huge operation in um, New Zealand, operations, vermicomposting operations in New Zealand that are all outdoors. Um, Mexico, I know a dentist in Mexico who has started over 70 vermicomposting operations on a really large scale, <laughs> like the largest tequila producer, you know? Think about it, they have all this organic waste. So yes, there are all sorts of ways of doing it. There's a woman in um, Afghanistan who has um, a big vermicomposting operation. She's the only woman. And think about it, in Afghanistan, you're not gonna, have fancy bins you're not going to be able to afford it um and so hers is all concrete blocks so yes it can be done on a very um zero you know a very very reduced scale <laughs> or amount so, of money but large I, scale yeah i love it and it's so fun hearing about the stories from around the world too yeah okay so ed has another question how do you keep them the temperature they need so um, again, I talk about that in my book because, you know, it is super important and I probably, I'm sure I mentioned it in my free resources on my website too, but, um, you know, it's actually easier to keep them comfortable in cold weather than it is hot weather. And we get, it gets super hot and very high in humidity here in North Carolina. So that can be challenging. And so, um, but when it's cold, there's just all kinds of ways to insulate their living situation. So that's where it is nice to have a bin, but you could put, um, you know, like the insulation around it, you know, so like house insulation and, um, or even um, uh, electrical, you know, if you have access to electricity, which I don't at my warm barn. <laughs> so I'm using the insulation that's duct taped around my worm bins. But um, anyhow, it, you know, you could use like a soil heating map, mat, you know? Um, so many different ways that you can help keep a worm bin warm or, or cooler, you know, during warm weather. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So Ed has another question. Is the ink from the newspaper harmful to the worms? No, <laughs> no. Years ago, I mean, you know, 20 years ago or something, they, they had um, toxic chemicals that were in the ink, but then, you know, it's like we've become more environmentally aware. And so, you know, they really, and there's a lot more recycling now. And so, you don't want to recycle something and have the, there's always going to be leftover residue, usually called sludge, and you don't want it um, full of toxic chemicals. So they switched 20 years ago to um, uh, soy or vegetable based inks. So yeah. Awesome. You yeah. And he just commented, he delivered. Hurt the worms anyway, because worms are actually used for to remediate contaminated soils. So, you know, cause think about soils and, and I had a Fulbright scholar work with me one time, he was from India and, you know, over in India, like they'll just take cadmium waste, you know, toxic metal waste and pour it on 
top of the ground, you know, and then, you know, barefoot children run through it. And so he cleaned up a spot like that using compost, vermicompost and earthworms. So, so yeah, the earthworms will ingest uh, uh, things that are high in pathogens that can harm you, you know, or heavy metals and that stuff gets absorbed into their tissues instead of, and very little of it exits their body and their poop. So, yeah, so it doesn't that's, harm the worms. And they that's so interesting. So not what happens? Nature. You what? What happens then when the worm dies? So the heavy metal system. Well, yeah, absorbed. so yeah, that's a problem. So it's not actually like extracting it from the environment. It's just replacing it in a worm for a while. Yeah, I mean, he ended up actually removing the earthworms and incinerating yeah. them. Which, yeah. So unfortunately, you know, then it goes up in the air. Yeah. You know? But that's an interesting that's the problem with the laws yeah. of thermodynamics. And you know, one of the scariest books to me was was it the cat in the hat or the cat in the hat comes back? The one with the pink spot and how the pink spot never goes away. You know. So unfortunately, we are stuck with things, but. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's in that situation, you didn't have the cadmium with the kids running through it, you know. Right. So, right. Yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. <laughs> so Mike has a question. So all these restrictions on the worms. So he's wondering if a more if more diverse worm populations would help all of this extra work. Well, I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry if you thought that I said there's a lot of work. It's actually very simple. I'm just trying to keep you from running into problems because I've been teaching this for 30 years and all sorts of things that have gone on. That's why, you know, like I said, oh, this is the most important slide, you know, where I talked about the, where the earthworms live um, because I gave a lecture one time and handed out my publication you know, my five page, anybody can read that very quickly. And, you know, a week later, somebody contacted me and said, well, I set up my worm bin, but the, the worms won't stay in the bin. And I'm like, okay, tell me how you set up the, the bin. And she said, well, I filled it with dirt. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> I did not communicate clearly enough that they don't live in dirt. Okay. So, so anyway, you know, I could tell you how to vermicompost in five minutes, you know, it's not that hard to do, but I do want you to, you know, just give kind of the ins and outs, things that could go wrong um, and things that are important, you know, like the fruit fly thing, you know, I mean, you don't want to have to deal with fruit flies, you know, I haven't had to deal with it. Because I've yeah. been careful, you know. But I think it's so. Well, they're just like, oh, whatever. I've watched people, you know. I've been instructed them. Okay, come on. Now you're going to cover your food waste, and I've watched them cover it, and I can still see food. <laughs> oh, it's like, come on. That's why I use the term OCD, you know. So it's not difficult. It's just be mindful of these things. Yeah. So. And I think. Um... I think it's so in, so I think it's so helpful to be proactive too so that you know if you have your worms you're like oh wait she said something about fruit flies how do I fix that yeah so, yes. yeah yeah exactly and so my guess kind of expensive so to me they seem expensive you know I don't want to I wouldn't drive down the freeway and throw $35 out the window you know and that's what you're going to pay for worms, if not more so, now, since there is a shortage. So, <laughs> so you uh, want to keep them alive out of compassion and your wallet, you know? So that's why I just, you know, cautioned you on some things, but that's mm -hmm. why, you know, I just spent over an hour describing how to do it. When you go to my website, you'll watch a video for four minutes. And it tells you how to set it up, you know, and, and, and it'll help crystallize things, you know, you'd be like, oh, okay. Um, and then I, I like to read things too. I'm, so I know there's a lot of video watchers out there, but I need to see it in print to really help absorb and I need my highlighter, you know, and so that's why I'm encouraging you to also read my 
five page, I keep it very simple and very brief. And even in my book, I wrote with, I always write with um, people with a third grade uh, education in mind. And I don't want something boring. You know, I don't want to read boring stuff and I'm sure you don't either. So I, you know, I do have a, I co-edited a 600 page scientific book on vermicomposting. <laughs> this audience isn't going to be interested in reading that, you know, but I mentioned my worm farmer handbook because it's very easy to write, to read. I wrote it in more of a folksy, accessible style, you know, so yeah. Absolutely. So Mike has another question. So this was um, when you were uh, talking about um, extracting the worms from the castings to uh -huh. use in the garden. So he's wondering, what if you just dump all the soil and worms in, I guess, where you want it in the garden and then buy more worms from the farmer? Won't the worms help the garden? And that had a question that I oh, was wondering why about. Why would they help the garden? About, <laughs> about native species too. Right. Um, okay, I'll get to that. But okay. remember, I said to you, this is the most important slide in my entire deck, right? Where I talked about the anisic, endogeic, and epigeic earthworms, right? And so the, um, the point of that is, remember I said that the epigeics, which is what Isenia fetida is, they live in a rich decomposing environment. Okay, and so um, unless you're putting mulch on your garden, um, if it's just one of those bare dirt gardens, you know, like a vegetable garden and it's just bare dirt that is, um, you know, eva the moisture evaporates and it doesn't have much decomposing material, worms aren't gonna stay alive in that. So you would not want to dump them out. And why that's like throwing the money out the window too. So, so maybe money is not as precious to you, but it is to me. And that's just it. They're, they're less likely to survive. Like in your worm bin, your, your worms could live well over four years, four or five years. So um, yeah, you, you would not want to put them out in your lawn, you know, or most places. So um, yeah, you just don't dump them out. And you asked about native species, okay? So as you know, we had the ice age and I'm originally from Michigan. So all the worms in Michigan were wiped out by the glaciers. And the glaciers came as far as North Carolina, but it, it didn't encompass North Carolina. So we do have a lot of nat native species here. So there are native species, but Overall, most of our <laughs> worm species were wiped out during the ice age. And so when Europeans showed up in their ships and the bottom of their ships had all kinds of soil for ballast, then worms came over from Europe. How many centuries ago? And they've been living here ever since. So Isenia fetida arrived with you know, the explorers, the original explorers and the pilgrims. So they have adapted here over hundreds of years. They are not harmful to the environment. So anything you've heard about, um, about uh, invasive species that are harming the environment, they are not Isenia fetida. Remember I said there were seven species of earthworms that have been identified that are suitable for vermicomposting. I didn't mention the other seven species because there's a few of them that are considered that they damage the environment. So I'm not gonna recommend that you use those, okay? But um, Isenia fetida is fine. And it's more recent, um, like Japanese and Asian worms that are causing problems in some parts of the environment, okay? You don't find them everywhere. And so, it's not, I mean, they're worms. It's not like they're steamrollers and just, you know, destroying something in a weekend. So, yeah. So don't worry about the worms I told you about <laughs> to use. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so Kristen has a question. Yeah. So she's planning to reuse an old cotton laundry bag and turn it into a flow through worm bin. And she's trying to keep the outside from growing mold since it will be living in her garage here in North Carolina. 
So would coating the cotton in beeswax hurt the worms? Oh, wow. That's a first. In 30 years, that's the first time somebody has asked me that. Good job, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know. I doubt it. But, you know, I mean, it's on the face of it, it seems like it wouldn't. I don't know anybody who has, so I can't definitively say no or yes, you know, but you could give it a try. Um, in your garage, I you know, if it's not insulated or heated, it could get quite chilly there. And I think you said you wanted to hang it. And so um, that can be a problem. Like, um, in fact, remember the can of worms that I showed you how it's on legs? Um, air, cold air could get underneath there. And so um, I had worms die one winter. I had one, I had two worm bins outside and I put, I had one that was on the concrete of my carport and I put some, some uh, corrugated cardboard um, be on, on the concrete and put the worm bin on top of it. So it added an insulating layer. And then I just took like a seat cushion from lawn furniture and put it on top of the worm bin and it was fine. But the, the one that was on the stilts had cold air underneath and those worms died. So, so I'm very conscious of that. If I did it again, I would want to completely insulate it to prevent that from happening. So interesting. That really relates to the next question from Lies, who's asking if you keep your bin outside, do you need to bring it inside when the temperature is below freezing or above 90? Not necessarily. Like I said, I only vermicompost outside now. So, you know, um, I keep it in the shade so that um, the sunlight never hits it, you know, because that would really get it even hotter. Um, and then, you know, and then I just insulate it for the winter time. And it's interesting in my worm barn where the temperatures really fluctuate up and down, um, you know, I initially took that, that, that uh, solid pink, hard insulation, you know, it's several inches. And I just duct taped them all the way around um, these four by four foot worm bins. Okay. So they're actually produce haulers. And um, so I had that on for the winter time. And for one of them, I took it off for the summertime, but the other one I left it on. And I found that the worms did better year round with the insulation on year round. So, you know, so it actually helped prevent, you know, it helped in the um, hotter temperatures too. So, so interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right. So if I were gonna do production, okay, if I saw dollar signs for that $1,200 per cubic yard, and I was like, I'm gonna be a worm farmer and produce this vermicompost and sell it, I would not be so casual about the temperatures. I remember I said I only feed once a week because they slow down when it gets so cold and so hot. But if I wanted production so that they'd be at the, the highest capacity and they'd be eating all the time and I could feed them two or three times a week, um, then I would want a controlled environment for them. So again, big difference between the small and the large scale. Very interesting. Yeah, just yeah. Yeah, depends on, on your goal, I guess. All right. So Mike wants to know, does vermicompost attract beneficial fauna? And I think he asked this when we were talking about putting it in the garden and, and the benefits it had for plants. Oh, beneficial fauna, not flora. Right. Yeah. Um, so so beneficial for, for critters that... I, I mean, it's great for microbes. Yeah, if you want to specify, Mike, in that what kind of what kind of fauna you're referring to that would be maybe drawn? Oh, insects. 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 Beneficial be insects. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody's done any work on that. You know, um, when I when you mentioned putting it in your garden, which I would never put worms in my garden, but I immediately thought of predators. So. You know, like 
all they have so many predators <laughs> you know the early bird gets the worms so you've got the birds coming down you've got moles coming up you've got you know all sorts of reptiles and amphibians and mm-hmm. you na- uh, and mammals Respial all leeches. sorts of things want to eat those worms <laughs> so so that's a problem you know that's why i mentioned they'll live a lot longer if you keep them in your worm bin <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, we have a terrestrial, uh, we have terrestrial leeches that are earthworm predators, which they're yes. really cool if you ever get to see one. Yeah. Um, well, and some people, I'm glad you mentioned them because, um, you know, the planarians, the hammerhead worms. Yes. Um, several people have contacted me. They freak out when they see them. Okay. They consider them like this invasive thing. They've heard that they eat earthworms. But again, it, you know, there's not just one species, there's a bunch of species mm-hmm. and they're not all alike. So some will eat earthworms, but some eat other things instead. So don't freak out when you see a, a planarian or um, hammerhead. If you see it in your worm bin, take it out. <laughs> and you don't wanna chop it up because it literally, every piece that you, create they will those pieces will turn into the whole animal it's really freaky that doesn't happen with worms but a planarian that's chopped up will turn you know you chop it in six pieces you'll end up with six planarians (laughs) so good to know good to know that is not how we take care of those and by the way they are everywhere so people are like ah i saw one on my property and oh what do I do? And it's like, it's not a big deal. It's just out in nature. And we really shouldn't be freaking out about things in nature, you know, unless they're trying to eat us, you know, I guess then you can run, but. (laughs) Uh, So Laura has a question. Can I use cereal boxes for bedding in addition to newspapers? Yes. Yes, you could do that. So you would want to Again, tear it into little pieces, okay? Shred it or tear it. And um, that would be great to have with um, newspaper bedding because news, if you think about the paper spectrum, you know, they come from trees. So trees, we know they've got nice hard um, trunks and, um, and then wood chips are very hard and they take a long time to decompose and And then, you know, you've got cardboard boxes, the corrugated cardboard that's, you know, real thick and which by the way, the worms love, it's like a playground to them. You know, they get right into those corrugated- Worm enrichment. They love it. Um, And then the cereal boxes are also, they also have some stiffness or structure to them, right? And then you get into office paper and think about how office paper is actually stiffer than newspaper, right? So um, so newspaper can get kind of crushed down and kind of mushy. And so it's nice to have shredded, um, you know, cereal boxes or cardboard in there too. Yep. <laughs> I love it. We, um, we do enrichment with our ambassador animals at the museum. And so that, so corrugated cardboard is, is worm enrichment. I love it. Yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think we have one more question. So Mike's asking about worm diversity. So would mixtures of species in a worm bin have a benefit as opposed to just using one single species? Well, actually some worm growers have figured out what species work well together. So some experienced worm growers, you know, professional commercial operations will um, specifically put different species together. Um, but in your home worm bin, it's best if you have Isenia fetida, but often, okay, so there's another worm, Isenia andre, that we call a cousin, you know, it looks like, it looks very similar to Isenia fetida. So if you have Isenia fetida, you probably have um, Isenia Andre as well, okay? 
And then there may, even though a worm grower may sell you Isenia fetida, like I said, it could have Andre in there. It could have other species as well already. But we wouldn't want to intentionally add different species, especially, you know, beginning like this, because they can actually not get along and one can overcome and drive off another species. So, so yeah. So that big difference between large scale and having a small worm bin. Yeah. Awesome. So I see somebody just asked where in Durham you can purchase. Yes. And I love these guys. And I, I got an honest pound, pound from them. Um, and it's called New Soil Vermiculture. New Soil Vermiculture. You'll find them at um, farmers markets, you know, especially the Southern Dur Durham, but I think they might be at the main um, downtown Durham as well. They're actually located in Northern Durham, but you can Google New Soil Vermiculture. I did yeah. hear- I just the dropped the link in the chat. Oh, thank you. Um, I did hear a couple of weeks ago, I was sad to hear this, that they were out of worms and it's the first time in all these years that they've been in business that I heard that they were out of worms. And it's because everybody wants worms. <laughs> but you can go ahead and try, okay? There's also somebody in um, Raleigh and you'll find her in the garden section of the state fair. She's always there the whole 10 days. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> it's very cool because somebody years ago, 20 years ago, somebody submitted a video interview or something of me that went to Animal Planet. And I don't have cable, I never saw this, but people would actually, you know, neighbors would say, oh, I just saw you on Animal Planet. Well, she saw me on Animal Planet and she decided, I mean, the light bulb went off and she decided she wanted to be a worm farmer. And so she came to, um, you know, do a, a, a a mind meld, you know, Mr. Spock mind meld with me and learn how to vermicompost. And she has been vermicomposting ever since and selling worms and vermicompost. And that's, oh, okay, thanks, Laura. Yeah, new soil is out of stock until March. So the one in Raleigh is called Red Hen Enterprises. Um, Sue, Sue fast too. Horner, and she's often out of worms. She grows she started growing mealworms and she loves, so she often has a lot of mealworms, but I think sometimes she doesn't have the composting earthworms. So thank you for adding that link too. Yeah. <laughs> and those are the only two I'm aware of in the triangle, okay? And then I know of some worm farmers in other parts of the state, some ship, some don't. <coughs> I do, um, I heard that a woman in, in uh, Georgia, it's called the Memes Worms. <laughs> so, you know, like she's gram, Grandma Mimi or something. Um, she uh, has a really good supply of worms. So she has worms right now and um, hopefully she'll continue to have them. So she would ship them to you, okay? So, yep. <laughs> Well, Vanda, thank you so much. I have learned so much from you today. This has been just so wonderful. Thank you really so much for doing this for us. We really are passionate about composting and vermicomposting and making the world a better place. So I appreciate it. So Julie Hall is also on this call. She works um, at the museum. She also works with um, Wake County Public Schools. And I'm going to share a slide really quick because with the pandemic, um, their compost program has been suspended, but they're doing some vermicompost. So let me show you um, some really cute pictures she just sent me. And Julie, you can, um, if you want to say something about it, you can unmute yourself. I know. It's so That's cute. So I love cute. it. That is so <laughs> so they're holding their worms. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Julie. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to share a local success story involving vermicomposting in the classroom, um, which I'm pretty sure was inspired by the pandemic, just because um, teachers had to change 
change it up this year. Um, a bunch of schools in Wake County started composting over the past few years in the um, in the cafeterias, but they couldn't do it this year. And so the teacher in this picture, Laura Wood, she started um, vermicomposting in the classroom. Um, actually, she, she might have been doing it previous to this, but in September, she invited other teachers, actually 14 other teachers, wow. agreed to vermicompost at their school, which is the Lincoln Heights Environmental Connections Magnet Elementary School. And so all of these teachers are vermicomposting, which is so great. Um, so kids are learning, you know, that they can turn their food waste into black gold. And now I'm thinking maybe the they could like get the PTA to sell it to actually make some money off of this venture. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, Laura actually asked the teachers to watch Rhonda's video to learn about vermicomposting. And she also asked her teachers to take a look at the museum's um, science at home DIY vermicomposting bin publication. So you guys have been very helpful. <laughs> oh, good. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. And I just love how that little boy is just like looking at that worm with such love. <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, those are great pictures. Thank you for sharing those. That's delightful. Awesome. And so it would be good to let the teachers know about the curric the curriculum that I have for vermicomposting. So lots of activities that the kids can do with their worm bins. Um, yeah. And those are available through your local county cooperative extension. You would contact them and the 4-H agent would be able to get you the curriculum. So, how about so. Um, are there grants for teachers to like more easily afford vermicomposting? Yeah. No. Okay. No. No. <laughs> no unfortunately, um, usually not. That's what you need to yeah. do with with selling with selling it. You sell it and then you sponsor new teachers. Yeah. Right? yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, All right. The guy who brought up you know, dumping out the worm bin into the garden, you know, and that's why I encourage people to harvest your bin. And if you have excess worms, which I think I saw a chat comment say that, you know, they did have extra worms. You can tell when it gets real crowded in your worm bin, give those extra worms to a teacher. Teachers really want them. And um, so, you know, you can contact schools or your local county cooperative extension office and they work with teachers. And so they want the worms for their own worm bins to go around and teach people, but they can also share them with teachers. So, yeah. And, you know, lots of parents will get involved in helping to build worm bins and you know, and, and that's what the woman, woman Red Hen Enterprises, she had back then, you know, now her daughter has graduated from college, but back then she was in elementary school. And so she actually did obtain a grant. So tell them, sometimes she can get grants, you know, um, it's just, you know, <laughs> hit or miss if grants will be available, but she did get a grant to set up um, vermicomposting of cafeteria waste at her child's school. So, and in my book, I talk, uh, oh, I've got some beautiful pictures and descriptions of schools I visited. Um, out in California, again, mild climate. The kids actually eat outside <laughs> and then they sort everything into recyclables and organics and feed the worms and, and parents have, you know, they created worm wizards that goes to schools and, and this group of parents, um, they actually obtain money from businesses. Think about it, like, you know, who is it? Um, I don't know, different stores will provide like $100 grants or more for schools. And so, um, you know, so that's what they do. They determine the needs for that school and then they decide what kind of bins to build. And then they often get the materials donated or <clears throat> also the, um, 
you know, cash money from local businesses and then the parents volunteer. So, so it's very cool. <laughs> very cool. Well, yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you everyone for coming to the workshop today. I also want to thank the NISE uh, Sustainability Fellowship, which is um, this is a, the series of workshop is part of that. And I'm actually going to drop a link to our next workshop in the series in the chat, if I can get there. Um, we have two more, actually. Um, we have one on composting, um, regular backyard composting, not vermicomposting, and one on black soldier grub composting. Good. So, yeah. Yeah, so they're awesome. I they call black are, fly larva the um, piranhas of the insect world. <laughs> yes. so, Rhonda, you shared the slide about the, the time frame with vermicomposting versus regular composting. And I think that the black soldier grubs are like really fast, yeah. <laughs> like, th like three days kind of thing. So <laughs> they're pretty amazing. So thank you all again so Thank much we hope you can join us again and have a wonderful rest of your weekend and happy valentine's day tomorrow <laughs> yay so, all, right. all right take care everybody bye, bye.